60%. I'm gonna say it again, 60%. Remember that number because it's about how much faster the GTX 1080 Ti was than the GTX 980 Ti in our testing back in 2017. Even now, in 2022, that's the single biggest performance jump we've seen between GPU generations. It was pretty epic, guys. And no, the RTX 2000 or 3000 series didn't come anywhere close to matching what the 1080 Ti did, which is why a lot of folks with those 12 gigabyte GTX 1080 Ti's are still holding onto them uh, even after the 2000 series and the 3000 series were launched. But if you look at the RTX 4090, I think this looks like it could maybe, just maybe, give people that holy crap moment that they haven't had since 2017. And I guess the real question is, is now finally the generation that'll cause those holdout 1080 Ti owners to upgrade? Well, what do you know? We're actually including one in the benchmarks just for the heck of it. And enticing upgraders is exactly what Nvidia is hoping to do here because their claims are huge. And I'm not even talking about ray tracing performance either. There's a bit of a problem with that though, because you'll need to pay a hell of a lot more for a high-end GPU than you did five years ago. And it's not just inflation either, good people, because while performance has increased massively, the possibility of paying $700 for a top-end GPU basically died with the RTX 2000 series. The RTX 4090 costs more than double that. And yeah, it also is $100 more than the RTX 3090. So maybe Nvidia has finally realized that they've hit the ceiling. Maybe. Or probably not. No, no, no. Mm -mm. Knowing NVIDIA, I don't think so. Now, I'm not gonna touch base on the other 4000 series cards here, but it's pretty obvious the 4090 is meant to be on a whole other level compared to the RTX 3090 and 3090 Ti. It boils down to this, more cores, higher frequencies, and yes, pretty much the same memory backend, but there's a ton more cache backing that up. Of course, there's a bunch of other things thrown in here like DLSS3 that unfortunately is, yes, just 4000 series exclusive, dual NVENC encoders, updated RT and tensor cores, AV1 support, the list just goes on. In fact, you can check out my video that I've done right over here where I go over all the features that come with that because I just wanna jump right into things, guys. And by things, I mean the 4090 Founders Edition design, it's huge and it looks like a brick, but also a tiny bit more compact when compared to the RTX 3090 card. But put it next to an RTX 3080 Ti and well, what do you know? It looks like someone tried to inflate the smaller card with a tire pump and the 4090 is the result. <laughs> I'm not even kidding, that's just how it looks. Now, I'm not sure these shots even do justice, but make sure you have the space for it before jumping onto the bandwagon, guys, because it is really big. And I also can't really fault Nvidia for this either, because even custom AMD cards have become crazy size too. Actually, the design actually looks a lot more streamlined than some of the most absolutely ridiculously looking board partner designs. Uh, with their in-house design, it feels like Nvidia has proven that board partners which is slapping bigger coolers doesn't automatically mean that it's better because bigger simply means a lazy cooler design. Nothing's really changed versus the 3000 series when it comes to video outputs since there's still a single HDMI 2.1 port along with three DisplayPort 1.4a connectors. But I will say that I really, really miss the USB-C port that was available with the RTX 2000 series cards, which is why I'm still holding onto the 2080 Ti on my ITX rig because that extra USB port comes in clutch when, con when it comes to plugging in connectors, external hard drives, and things like that. This is the most desirable fan in the Air Kingdom, and she's looking for a mate to release all the static pressure through the tiny gaps in the body of a radiator. Look closely at her blades, and you'll notice a superior tip clearance, all for higher airflow. It is hard to imagine a better defense system when the corners are deployed, but she can also modulate her power for different mates while keeping a discreet profile. Choose Be Quiet and Soar above the competition with the new Silent Wings 4 and Silent Wings Pro 4. Now, the big update here is a new 16-pin PCIe Gen 5 power connector. Well, it's technically 12 pins with three sense terminals. If you don't natively have this on your power supply, and a lot of you most likely won't, the card also includes a quadruple 8-pin to Gen 5 adapter. Now, just take note that only three of these eight pins need to be connected for regular gaming. The fourth is just needed if you wanna do any overclocking, but at that point, the fourth adapter will just be dangling there. Either way, Nvidia recommends at least an 850 watt power supply for this thing, since its maximum bore power in stock form is about 450 watts. And if you're looking to upgrade your power supplies too, new ones are coming with native 16 pin cables like this one from Silverstone. Um, you'll see that they're labeled as either 450 watts or 600 watts depending on the output 
of the PSU. Now, while we're on the topic of power, let's just go over power consumption. And the RTX 4090 does guzzle back a good amount of juice, but actually not as much as you might expect. Our liquid-cooled pre-overclocked RTX 3090 Ti actually sucked back a bit more. Yet, when you compare it to a mildly overclocked RTX 3090 or 6950 XT, yes, it's a bit hungrier and still nowhere near the insanity that some people had thought. Just be aware that peak consumption can be much higher and can vary a lot from one app to another. This is just a snapshot of what the 4090 uses in Doom at 4K. It also doesn't get really all that hot either, but that's more due to Nvidia's amazing cooler design than anything else. Because the RTX 4090 does put out a metric ton of heat, and that's something that you'll need to take into consideration when building a system around it. Now, make sure there's plenty of airflow, guys, because this cooler design is quite unique compared to some of the board partner ones that are out there. All right, so I guess this sets a stage for where this video is going. But before getting into the benchmarks, it's important to mention the cards we're using here because other than the GTX 1080 Ti, the RTX 4090 is the only one that's clocked at reference speeds. The others uh, are the 3090 Ti Strix LC, the Gigabyte RTX 3090 Gaming OC, and the Sapphire RX 6950 XT Pulse OC. Anyways, the first top is, guess what? It's not gaming. Mm -mm. Not gaming, folks. Because these are ultra high-end cards and people expect them to do a heck of a lot more than just game. So let's get into some of the creator apps first. And this is gonna be easy to talk about because the RTX 4090 just puts on a clinic by absolutely demolishing every other card here. In a lot of cases, it's almost cutting rendering times in half versus an overclocked RTX 3090 Ti. And that's just incredible. Also remember, AMD doesn't support either Keyshot 11 or My 2023, even with their Pro Render plugin, so the 6950 XT is still sitting at the bottom of those apps. Even in modeling programs like 3ds Max and SolidWorks, performance is by far the best that we've seen. And with these kinds of results, it really feels like the 4090 can take the place of the discontinued Quadro lineup for a lot of people. But there are some small hiccups starting with Premiere but not because of the GPU, because instead this result is actually being impacted by CPU-centric tasks, so there's only a minimal speed up here. The 4090's effect in DaVinci Resolve is pretty impressive, but there's some things to talk about here as well. First of all, AMD's found some kind of crazy secret sauce because the RX 6000 cards just destroy everything in render output times. Now this changed a few months ago and right now Radeon GPUs are the absolute best option if you're running this specific program. Nvidia's got an answer to that as well in their dual encoding engines but right now it's a feature that only works in very narrow specific number of applications. None of those cover our typical workload which is what we're showing in the benchmark. And yet once it gets rolled out to more output formats there's absolutely no doubt that the dual NVENC approach will dominate and resolve. And when you add AV1 support to that, we're talking about like a 20 minute 4K video render in a matter of minutes. And I think that's pretty mind blowing. All right, all right, all right. It's time for gaming. And we're gonna start at 1440p with the absolute maximum detail settings. Let's start off with the bad news. This GPU will be CPU or even game engine limited in almost every single competitive shooter out there like CSGO and Valorant at this resolution. But if you're playing at over 600 frames per second with 1% lows about 300, does it even matter? I guess that's a question that you need to ask yourselves. The interesting thing is there's evidence of CPU or game limitations in some other games too, like Far Cry 6, which never seem to go over 156 frames per second no matter which CPU and GPU we throw at it, regardless of resolution. The rest of the games though, well, I gotta say, the RTX 4090 completely dominates in average frame rate numbers against everything else out there. Compared to the RTX 3090, it's more than 50% faster in the majority of the games, and it sometimes even comes close to double that card's frame rates. It even leaves the liquid-cooled RTX 3090 Ti in the dust, and the same can be said about the RX 6950 XT. I mean, that's an amazing card in its own right now at $1,000, and it's actually a pretty good value if you're in the market for an ultra-high-end GPU. The only thing that seemed to suffer a small bit was the 1% lows in some games. While they're usually a lot higher than the other cards, some titles saw only a 10 to 25% increase. That's actually a bit disappointing to be honest with you. So that's 1440p. But let's be honest here. Most people buying a $1,600 graphics card are gonna expect it to play with high frame rates all the way up to 4K, even at the most extreme detail settings. And that's where we're gonna go next. And right away, there's something off here with CSGO. 
and I'm thinking it's a driver optimization issue since we're obviously not CPU bottlenecked after getting almost 1000 frames per second at 1440p. Meanwhile, the 4090 pulls ahead in Valorant, but it still smashes headfirst into the game's artificial frame rate ceiling, so its lead isn't as much as it could be here. But overall, in the rest of the games we're testing, the 4090's lead just grows in every single situation where it was a bit close to the 3090 Ti at 1440p, especially when you look at the 1% lows. And that goes for its positioning against the RTX 3090 and the RX 6950 XT as well. Now, this thing is first and foremost a 4K gaming card, period. More importantly, it's the first ever that can consistently push over 144 and at times 165 frames per second to a 4K gaming monitor in AAA titles. Now, when you lower the details just by a little bit, you actually won't have any problem hitting 240 frames per second. And right now, that's the bleeding edge of 4K monitor and connector technology. Okay, so Nvidia keeps talking about this thing being the ultimate card for ray tracing. You know, one that actually allows you to run RT without completely destroying performance. And yeah, there's also the LSS3, but we're gonna be covering that in a separate video, so stay tuned for that. But for now, let's see if the 4090 can push things to the next level without any frame insertion tricks at 4K. And yeah, this actually is the first card that makes even higher levels of ray tracing playable above 60 frames per second in most games. I mean, the performance reduction is still freaking huge versus raster output, and you'll need to be the other final judge of whether or not the final image result is worth a while. But at least it's possible. A lot more possible than any other card that's been released so far. Well, except in Cyberpunk 2077, since, man oh man, this, this game is tough when RT is turned on. But at the same time, it also looks really amazing. All right guys, so here are the numbers that you need to know. Based on 12 overall game results without ray tracing, the RTX 4090 is 43% faster than the 3090 at 1440p and a pretty crazy 52% at 4K. It's also 28% faster than the 3090 Ti at 1440p and 32% at 4K. The RX 6950 gets manhandled too. And remember, this is a reference clocked 4090 against one of the fastest liquid cooled RTX 3090 Ti's that was ever launched and two other cards sporting minor overclocks. And remember, some of those games were bottlenecked at 1440p. So when you remove those CPU or game engine limited games, things actually get pretty crazy. But man, if you're willing to drop a grand on a GPU, that RX 6950 XT looks pretty tempting. I mean, it's just a bargain. Now we also have to remember that this isn't a one dimensional card either, since it absolutely demolishes everything around creator focus apps too. So yes, in a lot of ways, this is yet another one of those GTX 1080 Ti type generational leaps that'll probably go down in history. But I need to put this into context because these increases aren't tied to a GPU that costs 700, 800, or even $1,000. This thing costs $1,600. $1,600. Freaking dollars, which is fine for the intended market, but the real question is whether or not the RTX 4080 series will be able to match those numbers. Because I think that's what 1080 Ti owners and a lot of other people are actually waiting for. And I guess that wraps it up, guys. The 4090 is, it's really, really impressive, even without all of the technologies that Nvidia packed into it. But to be honest, you're gonna have to pay a lot of money for it. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're able to take away everything that you needed to know about the RTX 4090, the new shiny GPU from Nvidia, the flagship monster. Let us know if you guys are impressed with the performance that this thing puts out. And until next time, I'm here with Hardware Canucks, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. I'm still recovering from a cold, but at the same time, I also want to convey to my fellow audience, spend responsibly.